Hello, everybody, and welcome to our junior college series presentation for students in the junior class and their parents. Uh, I'm Keith Glock, and joining me is Matt Pogue. We are counselors at Montgomery High School. This is typically a presentation that we would give in person in small groups to our students and then uh, do this part virtually for our parents. But today we're doing a combo platter given the circumstances surrounding education in 2021. And Matt, how are you? Doing all right. It's uh, nice to see you. You're across the hall and this is about as close as in person as we're going to get. Talking through the walls is a, is a little different uh, than what we're used to, but uh, we'll get through it. So why don't we uh, just go it right into this, Matt, and start talking about uh, this college search process. And this is really going to be a theoretical process uh, of how we would like our junior students to begin this search. So one of the things that I really like, Matt, uh, in doing this every year is that uh, you know, even though what we're doing is the same every year with our students, it is the students themselves who are different. And that really, for me, is what keeps it interesting. I mean, it makes it makes a new opportunity every time to kind of figure out somebody's wants and desires and what their needs are specifically. And it opens our eyes to different things about the colleges that, you know, the college isn't changing as much, but the student will make you see it from a different light. And one of the things that we talk about most with the students is we really want them to find something that fits them. We're really trying to cater all of this to you want to end up at a place that is right for you, not necessarily a place that you think is the right place. It's got to be right for you. And there's a lot of factors that are going to go into that. We just want students to think about how they're going to be on campus, what campus is going to be like for them, and all of the things that go into that outside of the classroom. And to start that conversation, we'll meet with juniors individually and we'll hash out all these things and talk about what they care about, whether they want to be close to home, all of those things. And we'll talk with the parents too, but we really want to speak with the students first to make sure that they are taking ownership over this and they're actually seeing themselves as a person going to college and not as, you know, my parents are coming with me, so I got to figure out what they like too. So if you're wondering what the timeline should be like in terms of when you need to get started, we think that right now is the perfect time. We can start talking about this. You're not behind if you haven't already figured out a list and where I need to go and all of that. So we encourage you talk to other people, talk to friends, talk to people who've gone to the schools you think you might want to go to only to get, you know, some impression of what their experience was, but then you have to compare that to what you want out of your experience. So you get some ideas, you'll do some more research, and then we can kind of talk more about that as you come back to meet with us. So why don't we get into some of the actual definitions and because I think that there is a lot of terminology that floats out there uh, that students are exposed to throughout their academic lives and they tend to make certain assumptions about what they mean and uh, I, I think we should probably really just define them for everybody. Uh, let's start with the easy ones, uh, Matt. The, the specialized institutions uh, like music conservatories, uh, the culinary academy, uh, things like that, That those are really for our students, uh, and I assume, you know, this is the, the route you've taken with your students as well, who really have an understanding that that specific field is what they want to go into. Yeah, that's not really something that we're going to encourage you to kind of test out and see. Maybe I want to go into that because that needs to be your primary interest and something that you've already kind of gotten involved with or at least done enough homework to understand that I want this to be my every day because the options are going to be so limited in terms of other classes that you're going to be taking you're strictly going to be learning that skill so we definitely would want someone to be pretty certain that this is where I want to go and you know not just go for the sake of well maybe I'll try it then we have our two-year college programs uh, like Raritan Valley or, or Mercer County Community College uh, where you'll graduate with an associate's degree. And for uh, for those schools, especially students who want to stay close to home uh, in those state schools like uh, Montclair State or TCNJ or Rutgers, uh, all those uh, credits and much uh, less expensive, we should add, uh, will transfer over to those state uh, colleges and universities uh, because that's really how the two-year college program in New Jersey works. Uh, outside of New Jersey and into other uh, New Jersey private schools, it'll be a school-by-school -school basis. Uh, whether they uh, will accept whatever credits you have taken at any of those two-year schools. But as we talk about four-year schools, I think this is where some of the, uh, maybe the, the misplaced understanding occurs. So when I say liberal arts school uh, to students, Matt, what's the, and, you, and I'm sure you say this to them as well, what do you typically hear back from students if we say, well, what do we mean when we say liberal arts? Well, one of the first things is uh, it's got to be small. 
Uh, it's got to be, you know, a lot of disciplines. It, it has to be very, you know, kind of diverse, and we have to be willing to be artsy and love nature and be outdoors, and all of those things kind of come up, and I'm not sure if that's really, you know, the understanding we want them to have. <laughs> I, I would completely agree with you. Uh, one of the, you know, the examples that we always use are, uh, well, I'll give you an example of a liberal arts college. Penn State, Ohio State, Rutgers. Some of the biggest schools in the country are indeed liberal arts schools. Liberal arts simply meaning that you can go uh, to that college and you can major in biology or mathematics just as the same as you could major in English or drama. Uh, so, but you're, you are correct, Matt. I, I think that the majority of our students uh, hear the term liberal arts and they think small and eating granola out in the woods and that's certainly not what it is. So let's get into some of this admissions vocabulary too. Matt, you want to just take us through uh, what I believe is the most uh, confusing, or not confusing, but confused uh, terminology, early decision versus early action. So when we ask students about this, we, we normally get an answer that's pretty close when we ask, all right, so what does early decision mean? Sometimes we'll get the word binding and sometimes they'll have an understanding of, uh, you know, it's a pretty serious commitment. But it's not necessarily that simple. It's a little bit, you know, more complicated. And that's why we want to have those conversations before a student does that. Because what you're saying when you apply early decision is, not only am I applying to your school, but I'm applying to your school and telling you that if you accept me, I will be going no matter what. And that no matter what is something that students also kind of like to play around with and see like, well, where's the loophole? And we tell them there really isn't one you want to be looking for because I think you'd be one of the first to find it. So it's a pretty serious commitment that we want students to talk over with their parents and figure out the financial aspects and what that looks like for the rest of their life because it is a big commitment you're making. But early action, on the other hand, is more of a way to work on your own timeline. And if I want to apply early and I'm ready, then you can do that. And you're not necessarily committing to any school saying, I'm coming to your school if I'm accepted. You're just saying, I'm ready to apply. I think my transcript is looking great. I want to apply now. I want to get my decision sooner. Regular admission, obviously referring to just, you know, deadlines that are typically. Uh, and then there are uh, some wacky admissions deadlines that have propped up, uh, cropped up in the last couple of years, like restrictive early action, uh, meaning you can apply to that school, but typically uh, you can only apply to other state schools and university, no other private schools. Uh, and if that is a deadline that you're going to end up utilizing, that's a conversation that we can have individually with parents and students. So now here is uh, what I believe uh, Matt to be one of the most important parts of this conversation that we are going to have simply because of how prevalent this has gotten. So the question is, as you read, uh, you're going to read this question and, and it's almost become uh, a commonplace uh, misunderstanding, uh, especially in our community, about the answer to this question. So as we roll forward, we're just hearing more and more that there is an from this is we're hearing this from our students and our parents because this is what they believe that there is an admissions advantage to applying early decision compared to other admissions deadlines. So when we ask students, why is it that you think that? The number one answer that we get is that the admission rate skyrockets. That means that they take more, it's, it's easier, it's easier to get in. Uh, there's clearly an admissions uh, advantage for me, Mr. Glock. All right, I'm going to challenge over the next couple of slides this notion, and hopefully it will make sense to you uh, at the end that there is not, and I don't know if I can be any clearer in saying that there is not an advantage from an admissions standpoint to applying to a school early decision. Okay, so let's ask ourselves why that admissions rate that acceptance rate skyrockets. But you all need to understand that you're very smart consumers of college. And you can't just take an admissions officer's word for it that, oh yeah, well, yeah, for sure. Uh, it's definitely easier to get in in the early period. When you are on a, a virtual Zoom uh, you know, tour with an admissions counselor, 
or if you're actually on campus and you're listening to someone speak about how much they want you to apply early decision because it's to your advantage to apply early decision because look at our admissions rate in the early period, you are going to ask this question. What I'm hearing you say is that your school lowers the admission requirement during the early decision period. You don't need the grades in the early decision period that you need in every other period in order to get into this school. Admissions officers hate that question because clearly the answer is no. They definitely do not <laughs> change those uh, admission standards. So how do we explain the higher rate of admission within that early decision period? I'm going to give you the answer. You need to take, well, and, and when I say you need to take, they're never going to show you this, by the way, but we just know this to be true. Which population is applying during this early decision period? The answer is a lot of guaranteed admits. Your scholarship athletes are applying in the early decision period. Those are students who have already been told by the university or college that they are in and that they are going to get a scholarship. There are certain schools throughout the country where if you are a child of a faculty member, that if you apply, you are guaranteed admission because that is part of that college or university's policy. Those students apply in the early decision period. Any other special interest students who uh, are recruited to campus it could be a tuba player in the marching band. It could be uh, somebody within a specific academic department because of a, a special talent that that student uh, has exhibited. Uh, all of those students who are guaranteed admission are applying in the early period. So that is a 100% admit rate for a large group of students. The other thing that we know to be true through years of data is that the applicant pool that applies in the early decision period to the most competitive colleges is largely a very qualified applicant pool. And to be in the qualified applicant pool, that means you are a small part of the population. So the total number of students who apply in the early decision period is not large relative to the overall applicant popul population. So when you combine the 100% guaranteed admits with a smaller group of very qualified applicants, you get a number that they a, a number of admits that a school caps and then you get a large number of acceptances based on that applicant pool so as they quote to you this higher admissions percentage you need to be smart in understanding that they are just fudging well they're not fudging the numbers they're fudging the pre the presentation of the numbers to you to try to get you to apply early decision but why so that's where this slide comes in. They want to control their yield. Yield is defined as when they admit students, how many of them actually come. So let's go and look at an actual example of uh, what it is we're talking about here. I just pulled out Lehigh, uh, and this was uh, a 2008 number, and their cost of tuition was $50,000 and change. $740 is defined as change as we, <laughs> as we get into the college application process. Let's assume Lehigh needs 2,000 incoming freshmen. And that's, you know, the places that they know they have uh, room and board for. Uh, it's just what they budgeted for. But so now let's say they accept X number of applicants, but their yield is only 1,900. So only 1,900 students have told them, yes, I'm going to come. So you multiply that 1,900, you know, or you, rather the, uh, the difference between what they want their yield to be and what their yield actually is, which is 100 students times that $50,000, and that's a $5 million deficit that the school is operating at. So they really want to get to that 2,000. If they get more students than their 2,000, they get 2,100. They don't have a, a place for 100 students to sleep. So they're going to have to make alternate plans, maybe rent out a hotel uh, where students are going to stay for the year. They don't want that either because now they have cost overruns. All of that eats into their bottom line, and that is not what they want. So they want to hit yield right on the head. They want that 2,000. So if they can convince the most qualified applicants 
to a, or just more students to apply in the early decision period, that means that they know they're going to have their pick of the litter of those qualified applicants so that they can make their incoming freshman classes statistics a very attractive group of students so that they, when they present that information the following year, you can say, look at how great our freshman class was last year. All of this early decision rhetoric, when it comes from the college, is because of yield. It's because of how they want to present their statistics. But I cannot stress it enough again. It does not. Applying early decision does not increase your, enchance, your chances of getting into a college or university. So aside from all of those things that we want you to take into account, just because this is about you and you getting the best out of this process, there's a lot of things that are going to be way more personal, which is why we want to meet with students individually and get a sense of where do all of these things fit for you. And one of the biggest questions we ask is, you know, how far away do you want to go from home? How big of a school do you want to go to? And a lot of times we get the answer of, well, eh, it doesn't matter. I'll figure it out. It doesn't matter. And we want them to at least understand that those things become a factor in your daily life as much as the classroom does. So if you're someone that's more introverted, then, you know, being at Rutgers, New Brunswick might be a little overwhelming and you might not enjoy your experience. But if you're somebody that is the most social person in the world, then going to a very small school about the size of our high school might also not feel like you either. So these are important things that we want students to consider, even if they feel like it's not going to be a big deal. It really could play a role in that. And we'll kind of tease out all the things that they're thinking about in terms of their academic choices, what's important to them, whether sports is a factor in their decision, whether they need to know that a certain major or program is available, and all of those things will help the students think about. But we really want them to take the ownership as you're shopping around for the college, not necessarily trying to fit what the college needs, because we want you to fit in rather than you adapt to whatever the college is. Well, Matt, let's let's I, you know. I think you are really a walking around great example of, uh, you know, something that we hear all the time. You know, you'd mentioned it. Well, I don't think I care about, uh, you know, the size of the of the school or uh, where I go to school. And I also hear often, as I'm sure you do, I want to get as far away from here as possible. Get me out of here. Take me to California. And I. <laughs> I know your story personally, so why don't you share a little bit uh, of that uh, with everybody? That was that was one of my, I'm not going to say worst decisions, but it was it was not a great one because I was that student that said, oh, you know what, I gotta I gotta go as far away as I can. If I'm away from my parents, then all of my problems will be solved because clearly I know what I'm doing. I'm 17, so what could go wrong? And I ended up getting out there, realizing a lot of the things. Well, that, getting out where? Hold on. No, you know, you don't, nobody's reading your mind. Uh, well, San Diego was uh, pretty far away. I literally kind of picked on a map. Where's the pin that's as far away from New Jersey as I can get? And I went there. And it was fun, and it was beautiful, and the weather was nice. But then everything else in life kind of came up, and the cost of the school, and the travel, and the airline cost, and shipping my things, and you know, not being able to go home for a certain break because it's not long enough, and all of these things start to weigh on me and I realize, wow, I might have made a mistake. So I really do encourage people to think about those things before they commit because you have to live your life outside of the classroom as much as you do, you know, be successful there. So there are a lot of things you think might not matter, but I can tell you firsthand they truly do. And hopefully you don't have to learn the hard way, but some people like to, so, you know, can't always prevent it. True story. And I want I don't I, I hesitate to call you a cautionary tale because you are not. I believe that you you've uh, you're you know, you're my boy. I, so, you know, <laughs> I, uh, uh, I think that you've turned out uh, wonderfully, uh, despite that crazy mistake, as you call it. Well, I mean, there's ways that we can avoid that. And I think that some of the things that we really encourage people to do are how you can not end up in that situation and visiting schools and finding a way to learn as much as you can about the, the actual environment you're going to be in and what it's like to drive there if you can drive and what it's like to get on a plane and, you know, have your folks leave if you're going for a visit somewhere. So all of those things we encourage you to do. And given how strange the times are right now, if there are open houses, great go. If you're comfortable and the school is still offering something in person, we encourage you to go because there is nothing like the actual experience of walking around on campus. You can look at pictures all you want. They are going to be glossy and beautiful and the best angles that they could possibly find of the campus. But until you actually walk around, you won't have an understanding of what does it feel like? Is the surrounding town really what I want it to be? Are you know, the dorms what I kind of like? All of these things are important. So the best way is if you can get there in person to do it. But 
given the times, if you aren't able to, there are a lot of virtual options that colleges are pulling out, and there's a lot of different ways to at least get a pretty good sense. And then when you do finally get a chance to visit, you can see if you're confirming what you thought or if you're you know, getting a different idea. Another thing, that cost, that pesky cost was something that I didn't think was a big deal, but I really should have considered more because it's not always the number one factor that you're going to take into account, but sometimes it is. And if you really like a program and you really think that this is a school for me and this is great, you also have to take into account, am I getting aid from them? Are they giving me merit-based money? If I go there, is there a scholarship waiting for me? And all these things can be a factor. So we really encourage you to look at the price of the college, but at the same time, don't take that as, well, the college costs $60,000 a year. I have no business even applying. Because that $60,000 might not actually be that number in the end. Because you might be awarded scholarships and you know you get a grant and a work study. And before you know it, you're actually looking at, oh, wow, this is $20,000 a year and I'm going to have a job. I think this is going to be manageable. So I would never let the sticker price of the college dissuade you from applying because you're going to get your financial aid package with your decision. So we really, you know, we want to know what that is before we say, no, I'm going to count that out. Because private schools tend to have that price tag that looks very, very daunting, but at the same time, they have endowments that they can offer to students and that price may not be what they say. So just definitely look at what you want, look at the school, and then kind of figure out the cost later. But it is a factor. We're just saying don't let it be something that stops you from even starting. So one of the things that colleges are looking for as much as you're looking for them is they're going to evaluate you on a few things. Your grades in your classes, they are going to be important. They're going to look at your transcript and see what you took, how you did all of those things and then your GPA and as well as test scores. Now the test scores is a little bit different now because some schools are optional. We had a change in the world and a lot of schools went to optional because you know it wasn't an opportunity and some schools already had that just because they want to have a more holistic view and they don't want to take a test score as the only thing that defines you. So these are going to be important things but they're not going to be the only things that matter because you're going to have recommendation letters, you're going to have your essay, you're going to have a chance to talk to people and get them a sense of this is who I am as a student and as a person. So there's a lot more that's going to go into this than just, well, my transcript is good because your transcript could be great, but if you're not somebody that's personable and you kind of don't really have any reason to want to go to a school, admissions counselors want to know those things as well. So we've said they're going to be going away to school. They're not going to be with someone else and saying, all right, well, you're going to be my buddy and you're going to help me through anything that happens and we're going to figure all of this out later. So we just want them to kind of take ownership over it understand that this is their decision, this is their process. As much as they're not alone in this, we want them to understand that it is about you making the final decision and living with that and being comfortable with it. So the other thing that we need everybody to understand who's watching this is students, if you don't have your email connected to your phone and you're not checking it regularly, that's just unacceptable at this point. Parents, if you are the ones still sending emails to us as counselors and to teachers and looking things up on the internet that your child can simply do themselves, there needs to be a shift there. And uh, especially as it relates to this college application process, uh, both the search and the application. Uh, we speak to college representatives. They flat out tell us, we need you to tell your parents to stop communicating with us. Colleges, quite frankly, do not want to admit students who believe their parents are running every aspect of their lives. Because as much as they want you to come, they want you to be, be able to stay and succeed. And at the first hint of trouble, if they feel like you might are a student who is going to just run and look for help from your parents who are, you know, maybe potentially a couple hundred miles away, uh, as opposed to being a problem solver and, and self-advocate and taking ownership of, of whatever that issue is and seek to resolve it, um, that you become a less attractive applicant uh, to a school. Uh, we really are looking for students to, when you have a question, we want the students to communicate with us. We want the students to communicate with the colleges. So practice on us. So this way, if you know, you're making errors, even something as simple as the format of an email, I'm going to write back to a student and say, hey, I'm really happy you emailed me, but next time you do it, here's how I want you to write it. Um, we are the practice for the real thing.
So now let's talk about, uh, Matt, what I thought was a huge change uh, just in the testing landscape. SATs and ACTs, as we know them, are remaining the same. Um, but College Board did something that uh, was moderately unthinkable for a for-profit education company, which College Board is. Uh, and they eliminated the SAT2 and the SA uh, option on the test itself. So the cost of the SAT went down. The SAT2 altogether has gone away. Uh, and these were, quite frankly, things that we knew uh, based on the information, uh, especially as it related to the essay. Uh, they just weren't a good predictor of what was going on in, you know, in terms of your life and how prepared you were going to be for, uh, for college. Uh, so the statistics on it just weren't relevant, but yet it was still being offered and your money was still being taken. And uh, just uh, recently, College Board came out and said, well, uh, we've wised up and we're going to eliminate these things. So the test is now shorter, which is great. Um, and the subject tests are gone. Uh, so the, honestly, Matt, and I, don't, I don't know how you feel about this. I heard this and, and I thought two things. I said, wow, uh, I'm shocked that they did this, number one. And then I just thought about the stress of our kids who are you know, bombarded with having to take this and that and that and, and time. And well, now I have to give up another Saturday in uh, in June to take these SAT two tests and just the stress and anxiety that the potentially that the elimination of these tests, uh, is going to create for our students is just, in my opinion, wholly positive. I mean, there's, there's another thing we have to take into account and it's that the colleges are going to see this too, and they are also going to be reacting to it. So it's really not something that we expect anyone to have, Oh, well, I have a solution to this and this is all solved. And you know, I need to, I need to figure this out right now because the colleges understand that we have to react to this. We have to help the students find a way to navigate this as well, because they are, they are the ones that are going to be having the final say in what they expect from students. So them knowing this news is also meaning change is going to come for them. So that's not going to be tomorrow. It's also meaning that we have about a year, over a year, until these things are really going to be applicable for this, this graduating class. So there will be things that change. There will be decisions that are made on the college's end that, that are going to help students navigate this. So I wouldn't say that anyone needs to figure out how do I address this tomorrow because there's time and there's going to be things that change before we, before we probably even know it. There's going to be other news that comes out with what colleges are starting to do. So you now as we look at, uh, you know, we know SATs and ACTs are not going away. We just want you to prep. Do some kind of prep, whether that's, you know, Khan Academy Online. If you can afford to, uh, to take a, a for pay test prep, uh, you know, system, that's fine, too. Um, just do something. Uh, and then how do we uh, keep track of all of this stuff? We talk about Naviance all the time. Naviance is a web-based program uh, that most of our students should be familiar with. If you do not have your login for Naviance, uh, you can uh, just email your counselor and we will get that to you. Uh, and one of the things that we think is the most helpful uh, thing within Naviance uh, we constantly get asked, maybe more than everything, well, where do I fit? Am, am I, is this school for me a target, a reach, a safety? How do I tell? And, th and that is through the use of uh, these scattergrams, which exist within Naviance. And uh, every school to which our students have applied, uh, the actual student information gets plugged into uh, this scattergram in a school by school basis. Uh, and this is one we're looking at here is for the College of New Jersey. So there's a lot of data points because uh, we have a lot of students that apply. And you see green check marks for students uh, with, uh, you know, a GPA and, and an SAT score. SAT score is listed across the bottom and GPA uh, on uh, the vertical axis. And you can just see uh, in a visual way what was somebody's GPA and SAT score who was accepted and rejected or waitlisted. Uh, and uh, you can plot yourself uh, on that graph and uh, see right where you fit. So the college visit thing that we discussed earlier is also something that we normally have reps coming to our school in terms of schools that are far away or just schools that we have relationships with. They're gonna come send a rep and give what they're considering a tour so it's going to give you information. It's going to them talk about their experience at the school if they attended, and you'll get a chance to ask questions. So we've been doing these virtually and having reps set up a Zoom kind of in the similar way that we were doing it when we had them in the MPAC. So we're going to continue that, and should anything change, the sign-up will still remain the same. It just eventually may be in person again, just not quite yet. 
So the last thing that we kind of want is the actual list. And this is where we're, we're well into this process. When we're thinking about these things, this is again, not going to be tomorrow. This is, we're getting into September, October, when these things are really on your mind. So that ideally would be, you have your list of schools, you have an understanding of this is where I plan to apply. We say 10 to 12, because what that number means is that you did research, you have an understanding of what you're looking for, and you're not really just throwing darts at a board and have 25 schools that you're applying to and seeing what happens. What that means is you may or may